Welcome. I'm Dee Dee Petri, President and CEO of the National Association for Olmstead Parks, Managing Partner of Olmstead 200. We're proud to co-host today's webinar, Visions of Reform, along with our founding partners, American Society of Landscape Architects and National Recreation and Park Association. Olmstead 200 is the national and local celebration and exploration of the life and legacy of Frederick Law Olmstead, whose 200th birthday occurs in 2022. This is the first in a series of video programs being offered by Olmstead 200, Conversations with Olmstead. These webinars will explore different facets of Olmstead's far-reaching influence on America's physical landscape and social fabric. I urge you to visit olmstead200.org to find out about many and varied programs across the country. Olmstead believed that the thoughtful design of parks and public spaces has positive social, environmental, economic, and health impacts on people and communities. These ideas were shaped by many experiences. And today, we welcome Professors Charles Waldheim and John Stauffer and landscape architect Sarah Zodi, who will lead us in a dynamic discussion of Olmstead's experience as a roving reporter for the New York Times. They promise to place Olmstead's ideas and work in historical context while examining the many ways in which Olmstead's legacy can help us address today's challenges. I'm pleased to introduce Tori carter Kaneen, Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and to welcome all of you today. Thank you, Dee, Dee for that kind introduction and for managing the Olmstead 200 effort. We are all looking forward to the year of programs ahead that will educate the public about the importance of parks. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. As CEO of the American Society of Landscape Architects, I want to welcome you to the first in a series of conversations about the life and legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted. During his life, Olmsted was committed to democratic access to public spaces, and he believed access to nature and beauty in design landscapes would improve community health and, in turn, social discourse. He believed public parks could serve as a democratizing force bringing many communities together to forge a new American society. But in some ways, he was also of his time. So it is important that we take a look back and re-examine Olmsted in the context of his era and through our current contemporary lens. Joining us for a fascinating discussion is our long-term partner organization, the National Recreation and Park Association. And I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Christine Stratton, CEO of NRPA. Thank you, Tori. We are excited to co-host this event with you and ASLA. At NRPA, we are dedicated to building strong, healthy, and resilient communities through the power of parks and recreation. And through his many landscapes, Olmsted created some important models, particularly when designing urban parks as systems. The Emerald Necklace in Boston, the network of public parks and parkways in Buffalo, New York, and in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Louisville, Kentucky, and Chicago. Olmsted understood that networks of interconnected parks would enable more people to access the health benefits of green spaces. And urban park systems could also be designed to improve community resilience through cooling and cleaning the air and managing stormwater. In his time, he played a role in some of the most challenging conversations about access to public benefits conversations that continue today. And today we'll hear from three professors from Harvard University who will place Olmsted's work in the context of American cities in the 19th century. It was a time of intense change with vast populations moving into cities, industrialization and immigration all shaping American urban life. I would like to introduce Charles Waldheim who will moderate today's discussion. Charles is the John E. Irving Professor of Landscape Architecture and Director of the Office for Urbanization at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Charles's own research examines the relations between landscape, ecology, and contemporary urbanism. His most recent book is Landscape as Urbanism, a General Theory. Charles, thank you. Thank you, Christine and Tori and Didi for that warm welcome and for hosting this conversation 
on the eve of the Olmsted Bicentennial year. It's my pleasure to be here. In addition to my role at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, I'm also pleased to serve as the Rutgers Curator of Landscape at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, uh, right there on Olmsted's Back Bay Fens in Boston. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today to both convene this set of conversations with Olmsted, uh, beginning with his visions uh, for reform. So over the course of the next 55 minutes or so, we'll, we'll be joined by two um, extraordinary speakers that will uh, produce uh, their thoughts about this topic. I'll introduce them both uh, in a moment. Um, I wanted to begin our conversation about Olmsted uh, and the notion of social reform uh, by taking us back to the 19th century. Um, at the end of the 19th century, uh, in the, the closing uh, decades of that century, a group of reformers and advocates came together to claim um, a new field, a new profession, uh, mostly on the eastern seaboard of the United States between Boston and Washington. This group of advocates um, in the spirit of Olmsted advocated for um, what Olmsted had referred to decades earlier as the new art of landscape architecture. Of course, Olmsted's new art um, and the next generations and several generations advocacy for the new art was intended as a set of very specific responses to the societal, cultural and environmental challenges of rapid urbanization uh, in the American industrial metropolis. Um, for our purposes today, uh, what's maybe interesting to think about is how radical uh, that project was at the time. Uh, and in thinking of a new field, a new profession, as a form of uh, a social project, a form of social reform. After more than a century, um, after 120 years of professional identity, uh, professional associations, including our hosts, uh, academic degree programs, uh, bodies of knowledge, and countless built examples of landscape architecture around the world, uh, it might be challenging for us to think about a moment when this new art was in fact a fairly radical uh, proposition. One way of thinking about that that we might begin with is this notion that it made a very implicit critique of the existing professional and disciplinary identities that of artist, architect, uh, engineer, or gardener. Um, and we have to understand, I think, in the situation of the 19th century, the extremity of the social uh, conditions, the pathologies of the industrial city, the, 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 the ill health, combined with the tensions of immigrant classes with respect to um, labor relations and the like. So in that context, of course, Olmsted is central to advocating for social reform through a variety of forms, including the formation of what comes to be known as landscape architecture. I thought I might begin the story in 1857. In 1857, in the context of the economic shock of that year, Olmsted, having tried farming and publishing, found himself with um, uh, reducing or shrinking options. And in that context, he agreed at the age of 35 years old to take on a civil service job uh, in the city of New York as superintendent of the new uh, park in the city, center of Manhattan. In so doing, of course, he very nimbly advocated for the launching of a public design competition. Within a year or so, he partnered with Calvert Vox, the protege of uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, the, the noted horticulturist and landscape gardener. And with Vox, of course, Olmsted won the design competition along a strictly party line five to four vote. The Republican reformers from Albany, of course, voting in favor of the reform park uh, known as the Greensward. Um, What's interesting for me about beginning in this moment of time is that 1857 and the economic crisis represents a kind of hinge point in our story as Olmsted pivots to a new set of practices, practices that he would ultimately come to describe under the rubric of landscape architecture. In this regard, uh, the panel today is focused on the notion of social justice, and equity, and urban and public reform as not new topics for landscape architecture, but in fact, uh, a set of commitments that Olmsted himself uh, mobilized. Um, in this regard, uh, we could not be better served than to have with us John Stauffer. Uh, John is the Sumner R. and Marshall S. Cates Professor of English and of African and of African American Studies here at Harvard University. Uh, he is a prolific author such that it makes me wonder what I've been doing with my time. The author and editor of 20 books and over 100 articles focusing on a range of topics, most notably around the American anti-slavery movement, uh, other forms uh, of adjacent social protest, and in particular, the role of the photographic image uh, in those topics. Among other uh, volumes, he is author of Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, a noted national bestseller. 
uh, The Black Hearts of Men, which received the Frederick Douglass uh, Book Prize, as well as Picturing Frederick Douglass, which was a Lincoln Prize uh, finalist. Uh, John Stoffer, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, two images of, or two photographs of Olmsted. Uh, these were taken around 1860. We don't know the exact date. So it, it, you get a sense of what he looked like around the time that I'm describing in the 1850s uh, and uh, 1860s. Uh, Olmsted was um, one of the 19th century's uh, major influential travel writers, and that led to his writings on slavery, uh, which uh, illuminated the South for uh, the North. Uh, in 1850, after his trip to England, he published Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England, which uh, received some critical attention, though it was not a um, huge uh, seller. Two years later, in part because of the uh, influence of Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England, he was hired by the New York Times, then a new paper, to cover the South and describe conditions of slavery and the South to Northerners uh, who had not been there. And in fact, by the 1850s, the Southerners were deeply suspicious of Northerners. Uh, and they, in fact, there was an uh, attempt to acquire new lands and attempt, um, there was a secession convention in 1850. So the tensions were huge. Olmsted published his accounts in the Times that described the South to Northerners. It helped increase the circulation of the New York Times. The letters became the basis of three books between 1854 and 1860, Journey in the Seaboard States, Journey Through Texas, and A Journey in the Back Country. And then in 1861, he revised the trilogy and published it as a single volume called The Cotton Kingdom, both in the United States and in England with a new introduction. The Cotton Kingdom actually helped persuade England not to recognize the Confederacy. And that's a, essentially a big deal because had England recognized the Confederacy, probably would have meant a rebel victory. Uh, after slave narratives, Olmsted's writings on the South are the most detailed and accurate description of the region by a contemporary observer. So in other words, if you want to understand what the antebellum South is like, the first place you go is slave narratives. The second is uh, Olmsted's writings. Olmsted championed, and this is throughout his uh, writings, uh, he championed improvement, restoration, regeneration. He was a consummate reformer in this sense. He, was, he never defined himself as an abolitionist, at least before the war, meaning an abolitionist at this time meant really a radical revolutionary. Slavery was such a horrible evil, it needed to be abolished immediately and abolitionists in theory embraced uh, racial equality. Actually, African-Americans really start the abolition movement. Uh, and anti-slavery advocates uh, believe slavery was an evil that needed to be abolished, but gradually, uh, and a number of anti-slavery advocates um, uh, endorsed colonization, which is a racist solution to uh, the problem of slavery. Uh, Olmsted, uh, as I said, championed in, in, in not just in terms of the South, but in all things, a kind of regeneration, restoration. He sought to improve the land, to improve the self, to improve society. Improvement is a central ver a term that he used. Um, and re improvement for Olmsted required community support. It required public engagement at all levels. Olmsted was a champion of schools, libraries, public discourse, newspapers, roads, canals, cities, and towns. United States at this time was a raw, backward community, and to create a modern infrastructure, you needed to create these things. Schools, libraries, uh, roads, canals, uh, transportation networks, cities and towns, hotels, restaurants, parks, town squares and greens. And one of the, one of the things that Olmsted really highlights in his writings on the South is the degree to which the paucity of these things existed in the South. There were basically um, virtually very few roads, very few schools, very few newspapers, virtually no hotels, 
very few cities and towns, no restaurants, and no civil liberties. Um, slaves were prohibited from reading or writing. And if you were a northerner, and Olmsted was very careful, if you spoke out against slavery in the slave states, your life was in jeopardy in the 1850s. Life centered around the plantation. The yeoman subsistence farmers aspired to become slave owners and planters and slave traders. And Olmsted visited a number of subsistence, uh, 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 subsistence Southerners. And most, he said, were illiterate. Um, and uh, I'm, I wanna show an image that I think captures Olmsted vis Olmsted's vision. It's an image, it's a kind of primitivist image of a plantation uh, roughly uh, in 1830, it's oil on wood, so it even captures in greater detail the idea of a kind of primitive uh, image. And it also resonates with something Frederick Douglass said in his, uh, one of his uh, slave narratives that he then published in Life and Times, which was the plantation was a little nation by itself, having its own language, its own rules, regulation, and customs. The troubles and controversies arising here were not settled by the civil power of the state. The overseer was the important dignitary. He was generally accuser, judge, jury, advocate, and executioner. The criminal was always dumb and no slave was allowed to testify other than against his brother slave. So the life really did center, according to Douglas and subsequent scholars have proved him, I uh, have uh, emphasized the accuracy of uh, his accounts. Olmsted, as I mentioned, emphasized that the, the infrastructure of a public democratic community uh, did not exist. In fact, he characterized the South as a kind of quasi feudal society. Uh, run and uh, led by the, the planter was the judge and executioner and in control. It's one of the reasons why Southern states refused federal money to help subsidize the roads and canals and transportation networks or to subsidize schools because they understood that if the federal government can, can, offers money to create roads and schools and other modern uh, implements of a society, it could also interfere with slavery. Olmsted emphasized that Southerners place greater weight on the monetary value of slaves than on the measure of work that slaves did. In fact, let me quote him. He said, the whole South is maintained in a frontier condition. And that's, a, I think, a resonant phrase. It's a frontier the impression one gets on going south is the general dilapidation and, uh, and carelessness which appears in even in the best of plantations. The nice white houses so common at the north, even in the remotest agricultural districts with green blinds, clean door yards, well-kept shrubbery, snug barns, green meadows and corner schoolhouses are nowhere seen. Even the most wealthy planners, Olmsted emphasized, who he visited, and they constituted less than 1% of the US population, they were the wealthiest Americans. Instead of embracing what Olmsted called artistical improvement, many of these wealthy planners lived in rude dwellings surrounded by cotton fields. So instead of canals, navigable waterways um, that other infrastructural uh, and aesthetic improvements, uh, Olmsted said the South remained uh, backward in that sense. Olmsted had this unwavering faith in the democratic process, um, which is one of the reasons why after secession and the bombing of Fort Sumner, he declared, and again, I quote him, we must subjugate the South or not only is our American Republic a failure, but our English justice and our English law and our English freedom are failures. The Southern repudiation of the result of an election, the 1860 election, which Lincoln won and Southerners decided to leave, 
is a clearer warning than we have had before that the Republic cannot be maintained any longer in such intimate associations with slavery as we have hitherto hoped. Olmsted understandably became a huge proponent of the war effort to deny this treasonous secession. He and virtually every northern, most northern, certainly almost every Republican referred to it as an act of treason. In fact, Olmsted, Lincoln, almost all Republicans didn't even use the term Confederacy. It was called the rebellion. What is a rebellion? It's rebels who have committed treason taking up arms against the United States government. At Fortress Monroe and elsewhere, or during the war, also Olmsted, another kind of a, a, a building on his writings on the South that illuminate the South for the North, is that during the war, he became commissioner of the United States Sanitary Commission, which becomes an important um, organization to help essentially improve the health of soldiers. He did not serve as a soldier because about a year before war, the war broke out, he had a horrible carriage accident. He broke his leg in multiple places and the, that broken leg um, was two inches shorter than his leg. So he had a hard time walking. At Fortress Monroe and elsewhere, he had trained, arranged for thousands of beds and hot hotels and other improvised hospitals. He used his vision of a reform improvement, his great, um, his great administrative skills to improve the health, uh, essentially, of soldiers. And let me show you some examples. In fact, Harper's Weekly, then the leading newspaper uh, in the country, it was uh, widely read in part because it was one of the most popular illustrated newspapers. These are um, full two-page spreads showing the work essentially that Olmsted had done for the United States Sanitary Commission. This is the General Hospital Fortress Monroe, which he turned into a massive hospital with beds, uh, improved cleanliness, uh, high worked with doctors. Uh, he also, or here's another image in the West uh, where he had in the center image, the, it's a hospital ship for wounded soldiers and sick soldiers. And the U.S. Sanitary Commission did not receive virtually no federal uh, monetary support. So it relied on a huge amount of voluntary um, uh, funds from us Northern citizens and uh, Olmsted did a considerable work in uh, helping to establish what was known as sanitary fairs, which things you could sell products as a way to raise money uh, um, to help uh, support uh, the United States uh, uh, Sanitary Commission. The United States Sanitary Commission is significant because it evolved through, crucially, the support and help and work of Clara Barton into the American Red Cross. Olmsted also during the war wrote the legislation for the establishment of the Port Royal experiment in which after the Union Navy and Army comes into Port Royal and they uh, free uh, the slaves who had been on Port Royal, uh, they give them their own ground and provide them with uh, loans to establish their own artisanal, um, independent uh, farming uh, family communities, which were successful into the early 20th century, meaning Af African-American families uh, were able to become essentially middle class or lower middle class independent artisans that, through their farming in the Sea Islands until the early 20th century, which most of the scholarship has not yet um, uh, uh, arrived at. In the largest sense then, Olmsted as a reformer, as someone embracing in improvement function in terms that were political, aesthetic, material, cultural, intellectual, these were central to his visions, and I think it's a, it helps to understand this reform vision as he applied it, especially in aesthetic sense, uh, to landscape. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, fantastic uh, introduction to understanding, and in, in a way, I think for uh, our audience, is kind of re rethinking Olmsted's uh, commitments. Um, you begin by describing Olmsted as a, a notable, a successful uh, travel writer. So he's, you know, he's, he's writing a kind of journalism. Um, 
what can we say or what, you know, what, what does the evidence support in terms of the audience between 52 and 57? Right. He's writing these letters. He's a correspondent, right. New York Daily Times. Um, clearly, there's a financial transaction there. He's making a living, presumably. Um, what can we say? He's writing for a northern audience. What can we say about his, his intent there? But by the time we get to the anthologies and to the Cotton Kingdom itself, there's clearly a political project to influence yes. uh, foreign policy. Yes. What, what can we say or what do we know about Olmsted's audience and his self-awareness of the political project as early as 52, 53? So that's a great question. He actually went out of his way to, tr to try to be balanced. Uh, he said that um, he said that uh, that uh, in some respects um, that uh I mean, it's a racist statement. He said, you know, some slaves prefer, you know, uh, liked being slaves, which is a nod to the South. Um, he or preferred uh, slavery to freedom. He quoted them, uh, so-called quoted slaves as saying that, which is why he doesn't come across. He's anything but uh, an abolitionist. Um, he's sympathetic to uh, the yeoman farmers and subsistence farmers. Uh, he is appreciative of essentially because there are no hotels in the South, he has to get um, bored uh, at, um, at Southern homes. And he's very good at, at asking balanced questions uh, that lead to um, illuminating answers. As a reporter, he's able to put his audience at comparative ease. Um, and uh, in his writings, if, when you start reading him, he's, a, he's the kind of writer, he's a very uh, dense writer. They're, they're very long paragraphs. Um, it's not an easy read. It's not like reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, even now. Um, so he's writing primarily for an intellectual audience. And one of the main themes that he tries to achieve is this uh, notion of a journalistic objectivity. He provides um, arguments both for, on, from the perspective of the South and uh, of uh, poor whites, of wealthy planners, of enslaved people. And uh, so he essentially does try to be um, uh, balanced. And his first three volumes are some of that. And so the, as uh, so tensions over slavery escalate. The third volume is less balanced than the first two, um, and uh, so that's that's one way of answering the question. And so many aspects of your account um, have you know contemporary echoes with us today, right? There's yeah. and, and there's so many obvious you know dimensions to anxiety about the federal government or the yeah. idea of imposition of <laughs> federal funding to you know, improve infrastructures. And clearly, your uh, you know your 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 craft is uh, is well honed there. I, I'm interested in, you know, the, the pivot from, you know, writing to a northern audience, a northern, you know, literate audience, a northern audience of intellectuals, and then the pivot to take the civil service role and to take up, you know, landscape. So the, the first piece of it is, what, what can we say about that? I've placed it in my own thinking in the context of the 1857 you know, economic crisis. But what else could we say? He's clearly still addressing a northern audience, but he's changing media. Or what more can we say about that pivot? Do you want me to answer that or do you want Sarah to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can suggest, I mean, when, you know, so he, he uh, oversees Central Park and, but he, uh, my reading, I'm not a landscape architect, but my reading is he approaches what he has seen, but you know, what the, what he sees that he wants to improve is similar to what he would like to improve in the South. It's very much an aesthetic vision. He sees, you know, uh, according to Olmsted um, and the biographies of him, before uh, Central Park becomes Central Park, that space there, were, it was a, an era where, or an area where a lot of um, paupers lived, a lot of, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, th there was nothing done to um, control or um, uh, prune um, or work on the vegetation that grew there. So it was completely wild, according to Olmsted. Um, and uh, he and his uh, partner, Vo, when they 
articulated their design. I mean, they very much, I mean, and so you could speak to this much better. So could you, Charles, it, it, you know, from my reading, they really wanted it. To, they, they envisioned it as a public space that would inspire and enlighten people who take advantage of it. And the Reform Park as in both um, a, a kind of theater for that performance, but also yes. a place where classes could mix and mingle and the immigrant classes yeah. could be edified as an educational project. And we have to, of course, acknowledge, well, the planning of the Central Park, you know, long predated Olmsted's engagement as a, as a civic project. Um, it did, of course, include uh, the forced removal of hundreds of people living there, including right. Um, right. Uh, a number of African-Americans. Sarah Zodi, in advance of my introduction to you, what, what say you about all this? What, 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 what can we say about Olmsted's pivot to landscape architecture as a medium? How about I give you a presentation about that? Let's do that. Uh, let me first introduce Sarah Zodi. We're very pleased to have Sarah with us. Sarah Zodi is a landscape architect and founding principal of Studio Zodi in New York. Uh, her work, in my view, is among the most vibrant examples of landscape architecture in North America today at the intersection of cultural histories and environmental presence. Uh, she completed her graduate work in city planning at MIT and her landscape architecture degree at Harvard at GSD, where she is now a member of the faculty as an assistant professor of the practice of landscape architecture. Uh, she has, in her uh, relatively young career, produced an astonishing array of awards and honors, including the National Olmsted Scholar of the Landscape Architecture Foundation. She's been named artist in residence by the Rothenberg Foundation. She's been named to the 40 Under 40 of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and most recently uh, this past year, named United States Artists Fellow. Sarah, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, so as was mentioned, Olmsted was commissioned by the New York Daily Times in 1852. Six years prior to that, in his personal letters, in a, in a letter to a friend, he is struggling to imagine what his life's purpose is. And, and he says the following. I want to make myself useful in the world, to make happy, to help to advance the condition of society and hasten the preparation for the millennium, as well as other things too numerous to mention. Now, how shall I prepare myself to exercise the greatest and best influence in the situation of life I'm likely to be placed in? You know perhaps as well as I what that is. I suppose it's no great stretch of ambition to anticipate me being a country squire in old Connecticut in the course of 15 years. I should... I should like to help then as fast as I could in the popular mind, generosity, charity, taste, and independence of thought, of voting, and of acting. The education of the ignoble vulgar ought to be much improved and extended. The agricultural interest greatly preponderates in number and wealth in the state, but perhaps has the least influence in legislation. Lawyers whose sense of right and truth is blunted by profession, the sense of law. Now the people, farmers and mechanics, the producing classes that the rest live on want to think and judge for themselves to cultivate the intellectual. So he goes on and on about essentially triangulating between his, his interests of in agriculture and farming and in law and in politics. And, you know, in his mind, there's no profession that kind of rounds out his interests. And, you know, this, this is really his state of mind as, as evidenced in his personal letters as he embarks on his travels to England uh, in 1850, returns in 1852 and meets Henry Raymond, the first editor of the New York Daily Times. So as Raymond is looking for a correspondent, uh, it, would, it, would, you know, it would occur to him that someone with that collection of interests and or, who has already demonstrated uh, a narrative voice and, and a, an ability to write in, in expository detail is, is uh, the right correspondent for this fledgling newspaper that wants to take an abolitionist editorial stance, but do so in an in, in objective, a seemingly objective manner. And, you know, it's notable that his, his uh, writing appears in the first and second pages of the Times. This is, you know, Olmsted's is, a part of the national discourse uh, and uh, really, you know, engaged in, in a public debate. Um, and, you know, this, this triangulation of interests is central to what, what we are calling a pivot. But, but from, in my interpretation of this, I think it's, a, it's actually not a pivot. It, it, there's, actual, there's, a, there's a linearity there of his interests that pull all of, the, all of these different professions that he has um, together. And so, you know, for me, this 
as as a lands- practicing landscape architect and an educator, I'm I'm also a black woman born and raised in the South, and um and and I've always felt that the profession had the ability to engage um, in wider issues. And on, looking back at Olmsted's history, um, I think that the, that there is the the, the demonstration of that potential is really at the, at the origin story of the profession. And so what's important to do is to review and to revisit that origin story. I mean, we often talk about, you know, Olmsted's early years as, you know, him being a journalist and, you know, a, a wanderer, not knowing what he wants to do. And so this is a sort of timeline of his activities as a journalist. And then we, we describe it as a pivot. Right. And we 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 describe it as, you know, he, he did all of those things and then he did landscape architecture and then he designed Central Park and then he establishes his firm with Vox and, you know, tr- you know, practices all over North America until his retirement. But if we look at the chronologically, he's actually going back and forth between his travels, his writing, his advocacy, his pra- his practice of landscape architecture. And so, you know, they are very much a part of the same project. And there is, you know, there isn't really a strong pivot. It is his interest from when he's 24 years old, writing to to Frederick Kingsbury, his childhood friend, you know, up until his retirement. Um, and so the other thing to note here are the historical moments that he's bearing witness to in this, you know, uh, in, in his lifetime and how his practice and his writing and his you know, his, his professional trajectory is very much in response uh, to, to these moments. So, you know, if you look at the last couple of um, entries here in this timeline, um, you'll note that he actually, you know, January 22nd, so, so as, as, as John referenced, a really important moment was Abraham Lincoln's election fall in which this, the southern states basically fall like dominoes and secede, you know, in the, in the months Subsequent, um, so that's late 1860. Um, so between the election and the beginning of the new year in 1861, the, the, the states are, are falling. And January 22nd, in the middle of all of that, Olmsted submits his resignation, right, to the Central Park Commission. And it, he writes a letter a, a few days later to a man named Daniel Goodloe, who uh, lives in North Carolina as a newspaper editor. And February 15th, so three weeks after, in, in the middle of, of this, the, the union falling apart, um, he begins a collaboration with Daniel Goodloe um, on rewriting for a third time this, this compilation of Cotton Kingdom in the, you know, relatively speaking, most staunchly abolitionist voice. At this point, he knows it means war. Uh, you know, he's, he's over trying to, to love the, the, the slave owners out of, Slavery. He he wants war, and in fact, he's rushing with Goodlow to republish this this Cotton Kingdom volume uh, in advance of what he sees as a coming civil war. Uh, and in fact, Cotton Kingdom is published weeks before the first shots fired. Uh, and and this is while the construction of Central Park is still still going on, right? And so um, he w- w- he comes back from the south embarks on the project of Central Park with the reflections of the South, and they're continuing to evolve. Um, But he returns from the South really thinking that in order for the North to ask the South to remain a part of this union, that the North must be the best version of itself. And, you know, his his takeaways from the South, as, as John's referenced as well, are that the the practice of owning humans is so corrosive to the society and inebriating to the point that even uh, humans that own other humans don't see each other as humans and have lost an ability to um, invest in, in themselves as a society, as a nation, um, you know, and calculations such as, uh, you know, the distribution of resources, including, Things like the health of the soil, uh, the health of the landscape, the health of, of people, and, and the economy in a broad sense are really skewed. Um, that there's no innovation, there's no civic culture or civic ground, um, no art, no culture uh, relative to, 
to the north. Um, and so, you know, this really, when he, when he comes back to, to rewrite this in 1860, in 1861, um, that really frames his rewriting and, um, you know, coming off of his work in Central Park and coming back again to rewrite this, again, the going back and forth between um, his reflections on the South and his practice of landscape architecture. This is really the clearest um, articulation of, of just how singular his interests in fact are. Um, if, as part of that rewriting, he and Goodlow produced this, this map, uh, this analysis, this spatial analysis using census data on uh, the concentration of enslaved people versus the health of the economy and basically trying to make the argument that there is an inverse relationship between the health of the economy and the, the number of enslaved people. Um, and, and while you know, slavery no doubt produces wealth among a few people, his argument is that an economy in a broad sense, again, things like the ecological health of the place, the, the, the distribution of resources and, and civic life itself um, are, are corroded by this practice. Charlie Beveridge, who, um, you know, is one of the foremost Olmsted scholars, makes the same case. He says, although Olmsted changed in five years from a farmer to a writer and publisher and then to park designer and administrator, the single problem of slavery dominated his thinking and gave unity to his various activities. Um, and so in reflecting, uh, you know, on this, on this singular kind of interest of his and, and the way in which that culminates in landscape architecture, uh, I decided to, in 2019, um, retrace his steps through the South. Um, and, and as John mentioned, you know, uh, the, the first place you go to learn about um, 19th century slavery are slave narratives. And the second place you go is, is Olmsted. Well, Olmsted, because of his, the breadth and depth of his travels, he's actually the most cited witness of 19th century slavery. And so in terms of, I mean, this, this is a kind of a, a mapping of, of the extent of his travels. Um, you know, he, his voice is an important one among historians. And I would argue uh, this part of his contribution to landscape architects as we understand his legacy is, is under historicized. And, and I just wanna to point that out as something that, um, that as a profession, I think we need to understand this important contribution of his. So I'll, I'll just take a moment to kind of click through some of the, the photographs that I took across these sites. So among, among a number of conclusions um, that, that came to my mind in retracing these steps were that in a lot of instances, the physical, the, 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 the social and the economic rather, the social and the economic conditions of what Olmsted describes are, uh, remain persistent today, 165 years later. However, the physical conditions of these landscapes uh, have been recast. They've been obscured or erased. Um, and, and in an ironic twist of fate, it's Olmsted's profession that he's advocated so heartily for that's often the tool or the weapon of untelling the stories that he wanted to tell about these places. So uh, I'll tell a quick story, for instance, about this, this image here um, taken from what's now known as Whitefield Square in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And in Olmsted's description, he, um, he describes it as being on the outskirts of town. And, um, and he takes great care in transcribing word for word the headstones of people here who were uh, all of African descent. Uh, it was an African burial ground. And um, 
so, you know, he's very descriptive, very expository, and which is what helped me confirm that I was in the right place. However, there is no sign or no marker uh, of, of the existence of what Olmsted found to be so profound that he, he just wrote it down word for word, the, these headstones, um, and was clearly taken with the scene. And so here's landscape architecture, um, you know, following his visit, recasting the story of this place. Um, and, you know, I, I spent a day here and everyone in the square knows Frederick Law Olmsted, the guy that designed Central Park. Um, did you know that he came here? No, I had, well, what are you doing here? Um, you know, and I had the privilege of being able to share the story of, of what Olmsted witnessed here and um, the demonstrated proof that there are, you know, remains um, of, of black people underneath this earth. This is now a wealthy neighborhood. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the, uh, a num some of those headstones have been moved up at, to another part of the city, lower lying on the other side of the quote unquote tracks. But it does suggest, you know, um, if, we, if we accept this about the formation of the discipline around these singular interests of Olmsted, you know, what, what, do, what, what position does that leave us in today? Uh, with this skill set, with this profession that he has, has he advocated so heartily for, um, you know, can, can those methods, can those tools and the skill set be used now, you know, in the same tradition, uh, you know, if we accept his visions for reform, what, what do those visions mean for a practice of landscape architecture today? I think, you know, if we, if we look at Cotton Kingdom and his, and his practice of landscape architecture as a methodological proposition, um, there is inherent to it um, a, a uh, multi-scalar approach to reading macro ecologies, macro economies, and then being able to scale down to the uh, site level, to the soil, to the topography, to the vegetation, to the social interactions and their relationship to the larger democracy. Um, and so that toggling of scales between the, the national events, the national, uh, the, the state of the democracy and what that means for a path in a park. Um, I, I, I would submit that this is the proposition um, that is born out of this kind of reframing of this reviewing, uh, revisiting of the historiography of our profession um, and in this period of, of Olmsted's life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that um, powerful set of images and powerful, powerful account. So uh, as opposed to pivot, um, a continuity of commitment, um, as opposed to the notion of shifting from various media, finding one's way, the account that I'm getting from, from, both, uh, from both you and John's account is one of uh, a polymath autodidact um, who's looking to construct a professional identity to suit his uh, political project. Um, and I guess the other thing that you surfaced there at the end, Sarah, is the notion of some tension or opposition between site-specific design and a political project or a broader, you know, kind of societal project. This is a false opposition in Olmstedian terms. Um, John, I want to give you a chance to respond to anything in Sarah's presentation, uh, and then I'll uh, open up to, to questions and say a little bit more about the audience. I think it was terrific, Sarah, and I, I completely agree. And I, it's one of the things I uh, had tried to convey. Um, I didn't go into detail because, as I said, I'm not a uh, landscape architect, but the vision that he had was very similar in terms of his um, writings on slavery, his, his uh, reform agenda uh, in terms of slavery and his reform agenda um, in terms of landscape. One of the things I mentioned is that he... He, he, he was deeply suspicious of privatized things, private plantations. You know, one of the things that he criticizes throughout the South is he can't find a restaurant. He can't find public space. You know, he, he has to go to these private homes. Every place he stays overnight, these private homes, there are no hotels. There's no restaurants. And his, as, a, as a landscape architect, I mean, it, it's about private space, improving aesthetically, culturally, politically, because if you improve something 
culturally and aesthetically, uh, chances are you'll improve it politically. So well I said. completely agree with, um, with, you know, we're on the same page just in terms of different perspectives. <laughs> Speaking of different perspectives, we have over 400 guests joining us today from across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a tragedy that we can't all be together, but it is wonderful that we're all here. Um, if you uh, want to, you can at the resource button, bottom left, uh, click there and download the set of slides to be able to look and scrutinize that timeline that, that, that Sarah was, was referring to. Uh, also on the left-hand side, you'll see green box says questions. We have a number of questions already stacked up that I'll begin to, to refer to. Um, so the, the, the first set of questions really have to do with the role of aesthetics. The one thing that I'm clearly struck by in both accounts was, again, no opposition between an aesthetic or a cultural or artistic project and a political one. That seems to be a very much our contemporary condition where we've got this disjoined realm between the political on the one hand and culture as somehow a luxury good. Both of you had touched on how Olmsted imagined uh, art, aesthetics, the cultural project as central to a political project. And I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on that and its relevance for practice today. Like, to what extent could we think of culture, think of aesthetic or artistic practice as a venue for social change? I mean, I, I could start. I, I'm here borrowing, and I don't know whether or not Olmsted read Frederick Douglass, but Frederick Douglass wrote fairly extensively on the relationship between aesthetics and reform. Uh, particularly during the Civil War years. In fact, he said true art breaks down, will break down racial barriers because true art or a kind of an aesthetic understanding that's faithful or true to the subject, it highlights the essential equality of all humans. It highlights that all humans, despite, you know, the difference in their looks, the difference in height, difference in, they are all fundamentally humans. There is a fundamental equality there. Uh, and it's consistent with um, uh, Douglas's aesthetic vision. And I think Olmsted's too, where you have uh, within, within uh, unity, diversity, and within diversity, unity. Um, in a sense, it's, it's what Whitman, Walt Whitman, as well as Douglas understood as e pluribus unum, out of many one. Um, they're each, I mean, for Whitman, each blade of grass is distinct and unique. Every blade of grass is, is different in the same way that every human being is different. But out of these many is one. And if we treat them all as one, as equals, despite their differences, that's the symbol of true democracy. You know, one of the things that I find so interesting about Olmsted's writing his approach to crafting his voice in Cotton Kingdom and, and even in the New York Times correspondences, um, he's really, in his personal letters, he's a bit more forthcoming about the fact that he's writing in without being very explicit about you know what he actually thinks. So he's trying to be subversive. He doesn't want to lose any audience members meaning those in the South. Um, and so I find, I find myself, you know, reflecting on some of the moments and the, the adjacencies in his writing. And, um, you know, and one of the common adjacencies in the writing is, you know, describing the qualities of the land in, a, in its aesthetic and sort of a romanticized form about how light is, breaking across the Spanish moss or, you know, the, the, the speckles of light at dusk. And he's, you know, he's pairs, he pairs that with really shocking descriptions of torture. Um, and, and I, and I, so, you know, and peppered in there are these very compelling conversations that he has with enslaved people. In fact, you know, quite a bit of his dialogue is, is between himself and enslaved people. And I find that to be notable. And a lot of those conversations are about, you know, w w the striving for life. What is, what, it, what, what is it that's most important to you? And so couched within that, couched within these, this, you know, all of these details about the landscape and the beauty 
um, are really essential conversations about life and freedom. And, and so, you know, in my mind, um, there, there, that's the, that's somewhat the proposition on, and, uh, and this is somewhat of, you know, I think reinforcing also of, of John's point that there is something, you know, quite profound about aesthetics that is inherently political to Olmsted, that these are not opposing um, ambitions, but rather um, it, it is the kind of the, the cultural and the aesthetic framing of life itself that make it worth living. Um, he has a very, a very intense conversation with an enslaved person in Louisiana. And he asks him, you know, so, you know, if you were to be free, who would you do? And, um, you know, and he says, I, I just want a plot of land. I just want to be out in the land and I want to have a wife and I want to just, you know, sit out in the land and, and, um, and work it. And, and just as it was a very kind of simple description of a relationship with the landscape. And Olmsted is, it's clear as, as unemotional as he attempts to be in his writing, it was, it was, it's a very notable moment for him. And so those, those, those are the reflections that he comes back to the North with and embarks on his project of Central Park and his project of landscape architecture. And so we can't, you know, really separate them. I think in the, the, the profession over the last 165 years, we have tended to separate those. Um, and, and, you know, if we go back to the origin story, um, as, as I would position it, um, I think that's what makes our profession unique. No doubt. Uh, we have a number of questions with respect to um, Olmsted's uh, commitments, both during the war years and after. Uh, there are two in particular that I'll reference. I guess one of the things that's coming across in this conversation, in this account, is not only the level of, you know, the, the, the writing itself, just the quality of description, his ability to describe, um, combined with a level of access, right? So, John, you touched on the boarding with the, with the landed classes and the lack of public accommodations for travelers. There's also, of course, great literature around the notion of his access to African-American church services and dance and music and all. He chronicled this kind of incredible range of activities and experiences for uh, Northern audiences. So, so one question from, from the, the, the set that's from Elizabeth Umbenauer, University of Washington, is you mentioned landscapes such as Port Royal and uh, Black cemeteries. Uh, if either of you can speak more to if Olmsted valued or promoted Black created or black owned landscapes. Whether he created or valued black owned landscapes. Yeah, I think the question has to do with evidence, you know, beyond, you know, the, 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 the journalism of, um, you know, the, the activity or engagement there leading to projects. So, um, John, you have any thoughts on that? So, I mean, I mentioned, and both of you, uh, Sarah and Charles, would know this better than me, but certainly in his um, writings, um, he comes, I mean, and one of the central differences between the North and the South is that the North is more beautiful in part because there's, it's far more public. There's far more public spaces, roads, canals, hotels, town squares the north is filled every little town in the north almost is filled with parks and squares that's open to everyone and the south so much of the south is private space that you need uh, permission to enter so i mean when he stays at planners homes and at Yeoman homes, he has to knock and request permission. He describes in numerous accounts being turned away and having to go, so, you know, walking another three miles to the next mm -hmm. place. So and I would much frame it in terms of that distinction between public and private. It's well, it's well framed. There's much more to be said here and many more questions to answer, including a question I would love to get to in our second session uh, about um, uh, Olmsted's practice of dissemblance uh, using aliases and this kind of business, but yes. we'll have to take that up in the next <laughs> installment. Um, yes. It's really been a pleasure. So on behalf of Olmsted 200, National Association of Olmsted Parks, National Recreation Park Association, American Society of Landscape Architects, John Stauffer, Sarah Zodi, thank you so very much.